Where does corruption come from? Who's to blame for corruption? Boy, talk about a pertinent topic. We're starting the letter of 2 Peter. And kids, be patient. Children's church will start up in a few weeks. Uh, but I'm aware that you're here, and I want you to listen. Don't just zone out, okay? Because this is for you too. We're starting a letter by old man Peter. He was older than I am. He visited last Sunday. If you were here, you got to see him. Uh, and he's writing this letter to the church, to people. I don't think he imagined that we would be reading his letter as to us today, but I'm sure God did. God meant it for us, and it's very pertinent to us Brazilians, us in Brazil right now. Where does corruption come from? The Bible says in this particular passage that it comes from evil desires inside of each of us. Corruption caused by kubisa. How do you like that for a bilingual statement? Corruption is caused by evil desires. And I don't know about you, but those evil desires are down inside of my body. See, 1 John 2, 15 and 16 say, Do not love the world, nor anything in the world. For everything that is in the world, and then it lists three categories of things that are all inside of me. See, when, I, when we talk about not loving the world, we think about all that evil stuff happening out there. But John says it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of what you have and what you can do. That's what's in the world. And he says, don't love it. Don't cling to it. We're just saying about that. All that I thought was valuable, all of my treasures, I realized were worth nothing unless I gave them to you and I had you as my treasure. And that's basically what Peter's going to say to us in chapter 1 of 2 Peter. I hope you have your Bible open. I'm going to read again uh, the first four verses of 2 Peter chapter 1 in the English Standard Version. And I want you to notice, if you have the NIV or another version, how some of these, especially the prepositions, are translated a little bit differently. So there's different ways you can think about these words which were written originally in Greek. Can I just say something about that? I was in a taxi with a Pakistani Muslim last year, and he said, yeah, but the Bible has, is, has all these changes. The Bible has been changed by people to say whatever they want. And the man that was with me who spoke Urdu was able to explain that there are 5,000 manuscripts in Greek of the New Testament that are largely equivalent. A few differences, a few changes, and you'll have those noted in your Bible. 5,000 handwritten copies that people know about which say basically the same thing. Many of them from the 1st and 2nd century. So we have the original, and we believe that it's inspired and inerrant in that original Koine Greek version. So the English and Portuguese and German and Spanish versions that we have are an attempt to bring that Koine Greek into our way of speaking and thinking. So that's what we're reading here, and that's why I like to read it from a couple of different translations. Here's what 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4 says in the English Standard Version. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's who it's to and who it's from. Verse 2, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Bow your heads with me one more time. Lord Jesus, we believe that this is your written word. We receive it as to, for us today, those who have received 
a like precious faith. Speak to us through it. Change us into your nature that we might cure corruption. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says the earth is rotting in the death caused by sin. Corrosion is ruining God's good creation in the world. Entropy makes a lie of the dialectic, for those of you who are philosophers. We're not headed for utopia. Things are not getting better. Just look at your child's bedroom. Entropy is true. Things tend to fall apart. Unless you put significant effort into it. The Bible says... Abel's blood, God says to to Cain, who has just killed his brother, cries out to me from the ground. And then further on, your land is soaked with blood. When I read that, I think of Sao Paulo. I think of Rio. I think of the violence that has gone on in neighborhoods of these cities. Lying, cheating prostitution and pride are just growing like weeds by the minute. And the Bible says it's in you and it's in me through evil desires. That's what Psalm 14 declares. There is none who seeks God. There is no one righteous. All have sinned. We've all fallen short. We are lost. Without the grace of God through Christ, we are the problem. So evident in our country. We have every reason to be a world power. Every reason. Except for us, the people who live here. Corruption is growing. And we've fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Let's look through this passage quickly. Uh, They say that Simon Peter is truly the author, and I think it's interesting that he uses both of his names, right? The old name and the new name. He was called Simon on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus came and says, your name's going to be Peter, because you're a rock. You're going to be a rock in the church. Simon Peter. I was Simon. Jesus made me Peter. I was the waffling big mouth. And Jesus made me a rock. I hope you know that transformation. That's what we're talking about in this passage. The transformation that comes by knowing Jesus. Simon Peter wrote it about 67 or 68 AD, just before he was crucified by the Roman Caesar for his faith. And he calls himself two things, servant or doulos, which could be slave, bond servant, apostle. I'm a servant of Jesus. I'm an apostle of Jesus. I wrote a note in my notes that said, boy, do we need some more of those. Apostles that see themselves as servants on the way to crucifixion for their faith instead of seeing themselves as the ruler of a kingdom who who deserve a brand new car every year. What in the world is that all about? None of the apostles lived that way. All but John, we think, were martyred for their faith. Servant apostles. Servant prophets. Servant pastors, servant elders, servant teachers, servants of Jesus who are gifted by Jesus to build up the body. Serving rather than seeking to be served. Of whom are you a slave? He says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. I hope that's true for you. And then he says, to those who have obtained faith. And I looked up that word obtained, and it's the same word they talk about when you get something by casting lots. It's basically the the luck of the draw. You drew straws, and you got the long straw. And I just want to congratulate you this morning for being here, for speaking English. You know, you're so smart to have been born in an English-speaking family or country. For being in Brazil rather than Afghanistan. Boy, are you smart. Having the parents you had probably had something to do with where you are right now. And you and I had nothing to do with it, did we? God chose for you to be born where you are, when you are. God chose for you to be here this morning. It's grace. It's obtained. It's received. You have this chance right here to hear the word and either believe it or not. And it's God who gives you that confidence that it's true. It's obtained. And it's obtained primarily through hearing the word. 
And so this is, these words are to those who believe it because God has given them confidence. Suzanne and I got to lead uh, a mother of five children to the Lord. Was it yesterday? The day before? Yesterday. Yesterday morning. We've been discipling this wife of one of our, uh, we call them the, the Abba boys, but they're not boys anymore. They're 33 and 34 and 37. And so they're married and she has a kid and he has a kid and they have a couple together and he's been trying to help her understand the gospel. And she says, yeah, I've been to church most of my life, but I just don't get what's missing. I don't really understand it. And at the retreat this, this weekend, she heard the testimony of another missionary and she said, that's what I need. And we walked her through confessing your sin, repenting of your sin, and opening the door of your heart and setting Jesus on your throne instead of you. And she read the Scripture and she said, I get it. I understand now that it's not by works. It's by grace through faith. And it's like the lights came on. And guess what? We baptized her in the pool yesterday afternoon. You can clap if you want. I feel so, so overjoyed about that. So now, is that me? Popping? I don't know why. So now, five kids will obtain faith through their mother and father who have been given faith to teach them the Word. If you've obtained faith, these words are for you. Those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. How? By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, Peter believed that Jesus was the God and Savior of the world. He believed Jesus was God incarnate. Jesus was Jehovah of all things. That's a big jump. That's great faith. But Peter's declaring that the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ gives us faith to believe and then imputes that righteousness to us through new birth and makes us His righteousness. We're going to talk about that a little bit further down. Faith is precious. More precious than gold, he said in 1 Peter. And faith is like faith. It's faith. James says, Elijah was a man like us, and he believed and he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three years and it stopped raining. Faith is faith. You, my friend, can believe and pray and pray some more and keep believing. And thank you, brother. And God will grow that faith like precious faith, Peter says. And then verse 2 says, grace and peace multiply. Not just added, multiplied. And I think of that as the more grace you express in the world, the more people start expressing it with you, and that becomes a geometric increase of grace and peace. The world is full of the opposite. So if grace is generous goodness undeserved, what would the opposite be? Covetousness. Evil desires. Get more than you give. Never pay more than it's worth. Grab for yourself while the grabbing is good. Everybody else is doing it. The opposite of peace, obviously, is anxiety. Which is a rampant pandemic. Grace and peace multiplied to you in what? Look at verse 2. I hope you're following along. In the knowledge of God. This is repeated a couple of times here. It's repeated down in verse 3 and then repeated in verse 8. Peter is talking about knowing God through Jesus Christ. He had the privilege of seeing, touching, hugging, swimming with, camping with, eating with, laughing and crying with the true incarnate Son of God. He and John and the rest of the apostles knew Jesus personally face to face in the flesh. We don't have that privilege. But he says in 1 uh, Peter that, that those who have not seen Him and yet love Him are blessed even more. Do you know Him? I'm not talking about knowing about Him. Do you talk with Him? I'm not talking about hearing physical voices. I'm not talking about seeing any visions. 
Talking about walking with a friend who's there closer than a brother, inside your thoughts, behind your consciousness, giving you a peace that passes understanding and grace for somebody that cuts you off in the traffic. Now I'm meddling, right? Grace and peace multiplied in the knowledge of God. His power. I wore my no God shirt today. I hope you guys can see that. You know, I was wearing this shirt to the grocery store one day and I had my coat on and this real weird guy with piercings and long hair came out and said, hey, cool shirt, man. I thought, why is he liking my shirt? And I looked down and it said, no God. It says no God. <laughs> so I hope you are getting that message and not this one. His power... Here we are, starting with God again. Verse 3, His power has given us everything we need as we know Him better. Everything we need through our knowledge of Him to do what He wants us to do. We are called to His glory and excellence or strong goodness, virtue. Your NIV, I didn't do anything. You're, you're in, can I use just this, this one, Kayla? It's okay? All right. So the NIV says, by His glory and goodness, He's called us. This one says, to His glory and goodness. The point is, God shines out with His glory and goodness to us and calls us to Himself to be like Him through the divine nature. I think it's interesting that Romans 3.23 says, we have fallen short of His glory. I asked the Lord to sort of give me an idea. What is this glory? It's not just like rays of sunshine. It's much more palpable than that. The glory of God is a theme that you can dive into in the Bible. And the best I can express it right now is through Psalm 16, which says, at His right hand are pleasures forever and joy in its fullness Fullness of joy and pleasure that never ends. My friends, that's what I'm looking for through my lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. I think that following my gut, my appetite, will give me pleasure and joy. Fun. Right? That's how you put pleasure and joy together. For my kids, the world's about fun. Have more fun. Have fun all the time. We could just laugh all the time. That would be great. Guess what? I think we can in heaven because it's joy unspeakable, joy in its full, and pleasure that never ends. And it's at the right hand of God for those who are holy in his presence. That's what he's calling us to. Be good like me. Be glorious like me through my nature in a dark world. We better keep going. This is a calling for everyone. Then he says, by which. <clears throat> it's a little complicated to figure out what is the antecedent of that word which. By glory and goodness, by our knowledge of God, or by his power. I just kind of put them all together and said, I think it's all three. It's this, by the calling of his power <clears throat> and his glory and goodness, we know him, and then he gives us through that his precious and very great promises. And that's repeated. He's, he's granted to us. He's giving these things to us. We are obtaining them by His grace, His precious and very great promises. I looked up some of those this week, and I found an interesting website. For those of you who didn't have a promise to say this morning, go to www.greatandpreciouspromises.org. Very interesting. The promises of the Bible divided into categories. Now, you have to be careful with context, right? Because a text away from context is a pretext. You can't just lift a promise out of the Bible and claim it. Read the story. Know the story. Identify with God and His people. And then say, I, as a follower of Jesus, claim that promise for me. We've done that at our house. You can do it too. Let me read a couple of promises that you can grab onto and that might just lead you to knowing that Jesus is God. In Genesis 3, when man and woman fell to the temptation of Satan, God curses the serpent, and in the curse, he gives a promise. Listen to what it says. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's a promise. 
between your offspring and her offspring. Paul defines that offspring as Jesus himself. He, God says, will bruise your, Satan's, head. You will bruise his heel. The promise of ultimate destruction of our enemy. Of course, Jeremiah 31 is the new covenant. God says, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor, each his brother, saying, know the Lord. For they will all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. When Peter's talking about the promises of God, this is what he's talking about. But maybe we don't have to go that far back. What if you just go to John 3.16, which says, Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. And if God turns the light on in your heart and in your mind, and you believe that, and you receive it, it will be true. And it will transform you, and you will be born again into the divine nature that Peter's talking about. Just ending, verse 4, So that through them, through them what? The promises you may become partakers of the divine nature. We become like God. We become sons and daughters of the Most High who shine with His glory and goodness instead of with the dark covetousness and corruption of the world. Escaping from corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. Believing the promises of God and knowing Him cures corruption, first in me and then in the world. Here's how, it's, here's how, it, how I uh, put these pieces together. His righteousness, God's righteousness, primarily through Jesus, and power give us everything we need through our knowledge of Him so we know Him better and believe His promises so much that we start to live by them while we wait for their fulfillment. So we read the story in our daily reading this week of Abraham and Lot. Remember how Abraham and Lot grew, their flocks grew, their servants fought, they didn't have enough room, and they came together and had a meeting. And they said, uh, there's no room for all of us to live in the same place, so we need to separate. What happened? Now Abraham's the patriarch. Lot's the young man with no family that, Lot, that Abraham has taken under his wing, his nephew. Abraham had every right to say, Lot, you go over there, because there's no room for you here. Lot would have had to obey. But Abraham, the father of faith, says to Lot, Lot, look wherever you want. You take what you want, and then I'll take the other side. I'll take what's left over. My friends, that's grace. That's grace. Lot looked at the valley of the Jordan, said, woo. That's where the power is. That's where the money is. That's where the jobs are. That's where the comfort is. I'm going to go down there. And he walks off with his flocks and his servants and his family. And he goes to what we know now is Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham stays behind, standing on the hill, and God comes to him. This is Genesis chapter 13. And God says, Abraham, look in every direction to the horizon. And I picture Abraham doing this. And then God says, everything you see will be yours and your descendants forever. Everything you see, walk through the land. It's all yours. It's mine now, but I promise that I will give it to you and your descendants forever. Now, if Abraham believes that promise, how will he live? graciously. One apiece, here you go. It's all going to be mine anyway. Forever. Want some money? Who needs money? My father owns it all. He knows where all the hidden gold is in the whole world. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You need some? I don't have a lot, but I'll give you what I have because my father has all the rest. Need to do something dangerous? Need to live in Iraq and teach English to refugees? So what? 
I have eternal life. Nothing can take that away from me. Need to support a missionary? Sure. I don't have everything you need, but I've got some here. Gracious living like God is gracious and grace and peace multiply because we believe the promises of God that all will be well. He will make everything new in the end. There will be justice and righteousness and peace and you do not need to take vengeance into your own hands. Peace, my friends. Grace. Multiply it. Be like God who is generous to the just and to the unjust. We need to come to a close here, right? The roasts might be burning. How do we interpret this? How do we, how do we extract some meaning out of this? Four points that I sort of distilled out of it this week, and I hope you're getting some others that I didn't get, but here's what I came up with. The cause of corruption is lust, or we might say in Brazil, cubiça. Lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, evil desires down inside of us for me and mine. It causes corruption, causes lying, causes stealing. It's my unloving old nature, which I have put on the cross, and I believe is dead with Christ, but keeps rising its ugly head like some zombie in my soul and saying, I deserve more. It's ugly. Second, the cure for this is the precious faith in God's precious promises which make me a partaker in God's glorious nature. And then I become the cure. You become the cure. A container of grace and peace to waft around the world in the aroma of Christ. Did I say it wrong? Yeah, I skipped the order. So, read that one. Knowing Jesus by faith gives us everything we need to do the third one, which is believe the faith, believe the promises of God, which make me a partaker in God's nature. And then we become the cure. We are called to His glorious grace and goodness. You know what I did is moved the PowerPoint order and didn't move my notes. But there are the four. Cause of corruption is me. Knowing Jesus by faith gives us everything we need to do His will. We're called to that will for glory and goodness, for grace and peace in the world. And then we become the cure by believing His promises for salvation and becoming like Him. His divine nature is formed in us. So what are you going to do about that? I hope God's given you some things to do. Don't just be a hearer of the Word. See, at Calvary, we believe that these words have power. These words give you that faith, that precious faith. They grow your faith, but they have power to the extent that you believe and obey them. The birds of the devil are right here, flying around, all those birds of distraction, and you're thinking about something else, and those seeds can just be plucked right out of your life and not make a single difference. God has said for you to do something. Make a commitment to do it. Tell somebody. Write it down. Here's some things that I came up with. Stop complaining and start confessing. Stop complaining. Start confessing. My anxiety, I'm not talking about your anxiety, but I have a feeling it's similar, is faithless rebellion against God's sovereignty. I wrote that down for myself. My anxiety is faithless rebellion against God's sovereignty. And I complain because I think I've gotten the short end of the stick. And I forget that my good Father is in charge of everything, even the traficantes, even the politicians that I don't agree with. Stop complaining. Start confessing. Jesus is righteous and powerful all the time and gives us increasing faith to believe that no matter what, so we can be like Him. Peaceful in the storm. Gracious to our enemies. Second, is this right? Believe the promises of God and live like they are true, like Abraham. 
Believe that the promises of God are true and then live by them. Don't live by your ashometro. Well, I think this is going to happen. Live according to the promises of God and you will become like God, gracious and peaceful to the end. And then third, live for God's glory and goodness, virtue, excellence. This word is powerful, and we're going to talk about it next week because it's in that list of things that we add to our faith. Virtue in this sense is strong valor to be good. It's even used in some places as masculinity. I can't say that today, but that's what it was used for in the first century. Strong goodness. The ability to be good even when you have the right not to be. Live for God's glory and goodness in everything you do because this is your calling. Whom do you blame for corruption in the world? Listen to yourself. Listen to your thoughts. Corruption is caused by evil desires inside of all of us. And the cure is Jesus' blood. We are all sources and potentially partakers in the divine nature who cure corruption through multiplying grace and peace for God's glory and goodness in the world. Lord, help us. We want to be like You. Thank You for Your precious promises and the faith to believe them. Now, live inside of us. Impute Your righteousness to us that we might be strong, good, gracious, peaceful people for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.